Okay, so today I'll be speaking to you about overpopulation and biodiversity loss. This is Earthrise, and this is probably the most famous photograph taken. It is the Earth um, taken by the Apollo 8 mission in um, 1968. The astronauts were um, orbiting the moon, and as they orbited that dark side of the moon, they saw light they came across Earthrise and they were overcome with emotion. Again, it was Christmas Eve. Um, they saw their planet. Um, they started to take photographs. They wished the Earth a Merry Christmas. And um, so this is really the first baby picture of the Earth. Uh, this photograph is credited with the start of the environmental movement. And I would say really for the first time, this gave us a sense of global identity. So two years later, 1970, um, Earth Day was really a cry for help. Uh, people noticed that there were um, extinctions, uh, pollution, overpopulation. And so on this day, 20 million Americans uh, demonstrated across the country for a more sustainable planet. Outcomes of this in the Nixon administration in the early 70s include the formation of the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, um, the Clean Air and Water Acts, and the Endangered Species Act. In 1973, the Gaia Hypothesis is proposed. And what the Gaia Hypothesis uh, says is that the, the Earth is a living superorganism. Um, the Earth has a circulatory system. It has lakes. It has rivers. It has oceans. And it also breeds. Um, it also maintains an atmospheric homeostasis, um, a homeostasis uh, just as we maintain. Um, further, it stated that the diversity of life, um, biodiversity, adds stability and equilibrium um, to the biosphere. So in 2000, the rare earth hypothesis is proposed. And what this says is the earth is rare, therefore complex life is rare. So the rare earth hypothesis proposes that we are an island. The earth is an island in a sea of um, non-life. We are life in a sea of non-life. The rare earth hypothesis is also called the Goldilocks hypothesis. And if you recall your stories, um, Goldilocks and the Three Bears, um, Goldilocks wanted everything to be just right. Okay? She didn't want the bed too large. She didn't want the bed too small. It had to be just right. She did not want the porridge to be too hot. She didn't want the porridge to be too cold. She wanted it to be just right. So the Earth, too, is just right for life. The Earth occupies a habitable zone um, far enough away from the sun, but close enough to the sun um, to have liquid water. So Venus, which is too close to the sun, is very hot for life. Venus has a runaway um, greenhouse effect, and it is approximately 800 degrees Fahrenheit. It is too hot for life. Mars, on the other hand, is too cold for life. Um, Earth also is just the right size um, to maintain its own atmosphere through gravity. Um, if it were too small, it could not do that. Furthermore, um, Earth is uh, just the right size because if it was too large, like a Jupiter or um, a Saturn, it would be attracting meteors and bolides to it. It's very nice to have these neighbors, these giants, Jupiter and Saturn, though, to attract those meteors, those bolides, away from it. So again, um, the Earth is just right for life. It is in a habitable zone. Okay, so again, the Earth is rare, therefore life is rare. So the Earth forms approximately 5 billion years ago, and life begins approximately 4 billion years ago. Over time, eons of time, we see this great diversity through evolution despite five mass extinction events. So if you look um, at our graph here, you'll see over time um, the increase of uh, diversity despite those troughs of mass extinction events. 
So these mass extinction events were um, generally due to natural causes, bolide impacts um, or climate change. So approximately 200,000 years ago, um, we see the origin of humans in Africa. At that point then, humans begin to uh, disperse across the continents, and by about 10,000 years ago, we begin to see um, many extinctions. So our current extinction rate is approximately 100 to 10,000 times greater than our background extinction rate. Our background extinction rate is the pre-human extinction rate. So the extinction rate um, that existed prior to humans. At this point, again, we are seeing approximately 100 to 10,000 times um, greater extinction rate since the arrival of humans. So scientists have hypothesized that we have entered our sixth mass extinction event and that this is really um, due primarily to humans. Overpopulation and overconsumption are the root cause of these extinctions. Um, basically, there are too many of us consuming too much. So if you look at this graph, I want you to notice a few things. Um, we have uh, population growth, human population growth over time. So what we see here is what we call a J-curve, okay? And what that indicates is exponential growth. Whenever you see a J-curve, something that you are measuring is happening very rapidly. What happens with exponential growth because of limited resources, we will eventually hit a ceiling, okay? We will hit a ceiling called a carrying capacity, and at that point, we will experience a population crash, okay? The other thing I'd like you to notice is just how rapidly we keep adding billions of humans on the planet. So um, first it's 127 years, then 33, then 14, then 13, then 12. Okay, so if you look at species extinctions in human population, um, on our uh, left y-axis we have extinction numbers in the tens of thousands. On the right um, y-axis we have um, human population in the millions. So what are we seeing here? We're seeing that familiar j-curve, right? So what does that indicate? That indicates that what we are measuring is happening very, very rapidly, exponential growth. So we are seeing um, human population growth, we are seeing extinction growth, okay? And what we are seeing um, is extinction growth very closely mirroring the human population growth. So what this indicates is that um, human population growth is influencing um, these extinctions. Okay, so with exponential growth, our growth rate and our consumption rate continue to accelerate. Resources disappear very rapidly, not gradually. So a proverb very nicely illustrates this. Um, if a lily doubles its population daily and covers a pond in 30 days, on what day is the pond half covered, okay? So the pond is half covered on the 29th day, all right? So on the 29th day, I look out on my pond and I see it's only half covered, okay? So I think I have time to deal with that pond. The next day, the pond is completely covered. So what this means is it really gives us this exponential growth, no time for notice or time to react. Okay, it has been proposed that our, po that our optimum world population size is approximately 1.5 to 2 billion humans on the planet. If this were the case, we would currently need four to five planet Earths to sustain our 7 billion humans on the planet. So where does this leave biodiversity? Okay. Threats to biodiversity include habitat destruction, introduced species, 
overexploitation, disease, pollution, and global climate change. So habitat destruction. Habitat destruction is generally um, loss and fragmentation of habitat. So we see here um, a satellite image taken in August 2012 of um, sea ice. We are um, on the uh, top of the world, North Pole, looking down on the Arctic. And what we see there is you'll see on the left side of that, you'll see a line um, showing uh, past ice occurrence, okay, since, since this has been measured. What we're noticing is approximately a 40% decrease in that ice occurrence. So how is this habitat destruction? Well, this is habitat destruction because for pagophilic species, that is, ice-loving species, um, they are literally losing um, their habitat. It is melting beneath their feet. So um, pagophilic species would be polar bears, um, ice seals, walrus, to name a few. Introduced species. Introduced species are generally non-native species which outcompete or prey upon native species. So our domestic cat, for example, our free-ranging domestic cat, in the United States alone um, annually kills up to 4 billion birds and up to 20 billion small mammals. Again, this is annually in the United States. Um, this was a uh, report done um, in Nature uh, 2013. Pollution. With pollution, um, often death, disease, low rates of reproduction, and biomagnification um, are seen. Biomagnification where um, toxins will um, run up the uh, food chain. So this um, satellite image shows the Gulf of Mexico um, and the oil spill that occurred a few years back. Um, they are still feeling um, ramifications from that spill. Overexploitation. Um, Overexploitation is generally the removal of species, wild species, from their environment. Um, hunting, smuggling, and collecting um, all contribute to this species decline. Bycatch represents indirect exploitation. And bycatch um, is um, largely seen in the fishing industry. So here we have um, an albatross that was a victim of what we call the longline industry. And with longline fishing, there are vessels um, with very long uh, cables, um, kind of in a conveyor belt system. And as these cables run up into the vessel, um, it has hooks, fish are hooked onto um, the cable. The cables run out along the surface of the water. And as, as this runs out along the surface of the water, an albatross flying over will see that um, fish and it will dive at the fish. And then that albatross, um, as the conveyor runs, will be pulled down um, and will drown. So again, bycatch is a huge issue where you are catching um, species that you are not trying to catch. Um, big uh, issue in the fishing industry. OK, disease. Disease often piggybacks in on um, piggybacks in with introduced species. So for example, um, Hawaii used to be an even greater paradise than it is today. Um, mosquitoes are now in Hawaii. Mosquitoes brought with them avian malaria. And the native species of bird in Hawaii did not co-evolve with, uh, with the mosquito or with the avian malaria. So they have built up no immunity to this disease. Um, since the introduction of avian malaria, we have seen um, extinctions in the native bird populations in Hawaii. And incidentally, with climate change, um, birds are actually um, kind of running up the mountains in Hawaii, and the mosquitoes are actually tracking them as well. OK, climate change. Um, some climate models hypothesize that we could observe worldwide extinctions of 15 to 37 percent of all species by 2050. Um, again, 15 to 37 percent of all species 
in fewer than 40 years. Um, the most daunting thing about this model is it's based solely on climate predictions. Um, all of the threats we just looked at were not factored into this. Okay, so species effectively have three options. They can migrate, they can adapt, or they can go extinct. And extinction is not random. And what this means is that some species are more prone to extinction than others. And this is primarily due to traits. So biologists have come up with a list of traits that make species particularly vulnerable um, to extinction, um, such as large body size, uh, migratory species, certainly climate sensitive species, aggregate species. So um, the elephant. African elephant, great example of a large-bodied species. A large-bodied species needs a lot of food. Because it needs a lot of food and energy, it also needs a very large distribution. The other um, trait associated with a large-bodied species is that they tend to be um, vulnerable to exploitation. And that is because they provide a really large target. Okay? Currently, our African elephant has been under assault um, for its ivory tusks. Giant panda, um, great example of a specialist species. The giant panda is a dietary specialist. Um, giant panda occurs in um, China. And if you look at that um, greenish zone, that greenish region in southern China, that is the panda's ancestral range. Uh, the range has now been reduced to um, just a few areas along that northern edge, if you can see those um, reddish uh, dots. Those are montane regions. Now, if, our, um, if we were to have forest fires in this region, or let's say a blight or a fungus, and we lost the bamboo, we would lose our giant panda. Okay, Arctic tern, wonderful example of a migratory species. This species will fly from the North Pole to the South Pole and back annually. It takes an awful lot of energy um, to make a migration. Further, migratory paths, migratory corridors need to be um, safe, they need to be pristine so that these species can um, survive the migration in order to reproduce. Okay, red-eyed tree frog, wonderful example of a poor disperser. So amphibians in general tend to be poor dispersers. They don't have wings, okay, they don't fly. They're small, um, their skin is moist, and because their skin is moist, they, they're, they're tied into aquatic systems. They need to be near fresh water. Um, certainly their eggs as well um, need to be uh, near fresh water. So we are seeing a lot of amphibian extinctions worldwide. Okay, polar bear, um, great example of a climate sensitive species. The polar bear, of course, is our poster child for climate change, again. Um, the habitat of the polar bear is literally, literally melting beneath its feet. Monarch butterfly, um, a wonderful example of an aggregate species. And an aggregate species is basically a species that will group at some point um, in its annual cycle, at some point seasonally, even if it is a solitary species. Um, they generally do this to reproduce. So with our monarch butterfly, um, in the United States we have um, effectively two populations that are divided by the Rocky Mountains. So we have a western population, we have an, an eastern population. And um, our eastern population will funnel down um, to Mexico and it will overwinter there. What happens with the monarch butterfly and aggregate species, um, aggregates tend to be prone to uh, predation events. Um, they also tend to be prone to what we call stochastic events. These would be um, random events. So for example, 
um, in the winter of 1995-1996, uh, um, when the butterflies were um, aggregating and overwintering, there was a, a very large ice storm um, in that refuge in Mexico. And millions of butterflies were lost. So again, aggregate species um, are effectively having your eggs in one basket, and they can be prone to predation events as well as stochastic events. Okay, northern hairy-nosed wombat. Great example of a species with low genetic diversity. Um, in 1981, the wombats were reduced to 20 individuals. Okay, so what happened is you have a population that was very large at one point, but then the pool was reduced to 20 individuals. So let's say, for example, um, in that very large population, you had red-eyed wombats, green-eyed wombats, blue-eyed wombats, yellow-eyed wombats. Let's say through that funnel, with this very small population of 20, um, you just had red-eyed wombats. Well, let's say that the blue eyed wombats um, actually were much more adaptable to climate change, for example. Well, we would have lost that gene, okay? And once that gene is lost, it is gone forever. So for low genetic um, diversity, it's very difficult um, to adapt to changing conditions. Caspian seal, great example of an island species. Um, in terms of the seal, uh, the Caspian Sea really is an island, right? It is surrounded effectively by a sea of land, okay? The Caspian Seal is restricted. It's, eff it's effectively an aggregate species. Um, it cannot move out of that um, Caspian Sea region. It cannot move to these um, waterways across the land. So it is prone um, to those stochastic events, it is prone to exploitation. So again, island species tend to be prone to extinction. Black-footed ferret, um, great example of a species with small populations and few populations. Um, this species is endemic to the Great Plains of the United States. Um, it was discovered by it was thought to be extinct actually in the 1970s. In the 1980s, one population in Matitsi, Wyoming was discovered by a dog. So very small population was discovered, conservationists were elated, um, and what conservationists decided to do was reintroduce this species across the Great Plains, okay, where it had ancestrally occurred. So small populations, it's effectively putting your eggs in different baskets. Um, the difficulty with that is once you have small populations, it's difficult to bring those numbers up. And with few populations, um, your genetic diversity is lost. You don't have that large pool that we just um, discussed. And there's no immigration and emigration between those populations. Um, Incidentally, the black-footed ferret is also a dietary specialist. It feeds on prairie dogs, and um, in the West, the prairie dog has been considered a pest um, really since um, probably the late 1800s, and the prairie dog has been exterminated in about 97 percent of its um, ancestral distribution. So um, a difficult future for our black-footed ferret um, along with our prairie dogs. Mountain gorilla. Um, I chose the mountain gorilla because it is really one of our closest relatives on the planet. Um, the mountain gorilla um, occurs at the confluence of uh, three African countries, um, Uganda, uh, Rwanda, and the Congo, um, in those greenish um, zones. And these countries have really been um, rather unstable in conflict, a lot of civil war. Um, and the mountain gorilla has literally uh, been uh, caught in the crossfire. So an example of a range-restricted species, even if there was habitat for it to move into, um, difficult when there is so much um, conflict. So these species are especially vulnerable due to multiple traits. Um, if you think back, most of these species have overlapping traits. 
Okay? Further, evidence suggests that the most complex organisms tend to be the most prone to extinction. So why is biodiversity important? Um, we spoke at the beginning, biodiversity is important um, as it adds the stability um, to our biosphere. Biodiversity is important because it, it provides us with services. Um, photosynthesis, where plants um, give us oxygen. Um, water purification by some species, where toxins are removed and filtered from our water. Pollination, um, we have bees, we have birds, bats, um, other insects pollinating. And all of these services are at no charge, okay? Costs us nothing. Um, Biodiversity is also important for food, right? It's important for medicines. Um, many plants in the um, uh, rainforests, for example, um, have a very complex chemistry, and we have synthesized um, many new medicines uh, from these plants. Biomimicry um, also has provided great design ideas um, in engineering, um, in architecture, so we don't have to reinvent the wheel, okay? Biology already shows us how to do it over eons of evolution. Um, finally, I think uh, biodiversity is intrinsically important. Um, it certainly provides us with uh, spirituality, um, a cultural basis, religious, uh, also educational and recreational. So what can be done globally to save biodiversity? Um, we can certainly uh, reduce global population. And all of these things really can be done um, at many levels, right? The individual level, um, government level, international level. So reducing global population, um, certainly making birth control more accessible um, worldwide, um, China, uh, introduced a one-child policy as it saw that um, its population was um, burgeoning. Um, also, education of women. It has been found that educating women, um, women will have fewer children and they will have children later in life. So this overall helps to reduce um, global population. Certainly, we can reduce resource consumption. Um, first world nations, we, we we consume too much. We have become a, a shopping culture, a, a culture of consumption. Reducing resource consumption um, would help enormously. Reversing climate change. Um, reversing climate change would certainly um, help to preserve biodiversity. Preserving habitat, which also goes hand in hand with uh, reversing climate change. Um, having more carbon sinks, um, preserving our oceans, preserving our forests so that um, the carbon that is going out in our atmosphere actually sinks into um, these uh, carbon sinks, these habitats. Providing more habitat would also be a, a great solution for biodiversity. So in conclusion, really, um, I think we need a paradigm shift overall, um, a reevaluation, reconsideration of our uh, traditional values, also a reevaluation of our politics, our economics um, towards a more sustainable planet.